Hello, Jan. Thank you. Thank you to be there with us today. For this year, 2020, the Villa Gilet is organizing its Assise Internationale du Roman, International Conference on the Novel, around the time of uncertainty. And uh, this is well suited to the health crisis we are now experiencing. But mm -hmm. it is important to make the voice of authors like you uh, to be heard whether, wherever they are in the world, despite this uh, lockdown. And this explains the digital intervention with you, Jan Stoklasa, who honors us with your presence, and uh, we thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, it's good to be here. <laughs> Even though it's virtual only. Yes, <laughs> virtual, but actual. <laughs> yeah. In French, um, ah, sorry, it's back, but, uh, so, uh, sorry. Hey, hey. In French, La Folle Enquête de Stig Larsson, in mm -hmm. English, The Man Who Played With Fire, um, was first published in 2018 in Sweden by a book fabricant, that's it, before mm -hmm. being translated into 27 languages. Yes. <laughs> and, you made, uh, sorry. and you made Stig Larsson the hero of a documentary novel. Mm -hmm. Documentary novel, it's a contradictory name, part of information, and a tiny bit of fiction, and it's interesting, we'll come to that. Mm -hmm. uh, for the French public, uh, Stig Larsson was above all the author of the successful uh, crime novels Millennium, but first of all, like you, he was, um, he was, a, a, sorry, he was a, a, a comic journalist with strong political convictions, and uh, therefore, a large part of his work has consisted of investigating uh, the assassination of uh, Prime Minister Olof Palme on the 20th uh, of February, 1986. But uh, although you never met still, you had access to his archives. Uh, this is, by the way, um, the word that can be recognized in the, in the original title, Stieg Larsson Archive, mm -hmm. archive in English, that's interesting too. Um, you said that you wanted to write an accessible book. In the first part, you present Stieg Larsson's investigation, and then in the second part, you take it further to finally reveal to the truth to us. Which brings us to my first question. Uh, with interlocking effects, you talking about Stieg Larsson when himself is talking about Olaf Palme. Mm -hmm. Is that a way to capture the reader, not in an actual trap, but in a kind of game, maze, labyrinth? Yeah, I, I think what you said that I wanted to write an accessible book and this is the way that I chose to write it. And um, I, I've tried to written it as a, as, a, as a thriller actually, where everything is true. So when I, I fictionalize a dialogue with, with Stieg that I didn't meet, um, I have always spoken to some of his friends or his partner, Eva Gabrielson, and asked questions. So the meetings that I describe are always real meetings. Uh, and I also, towards the end of the book, describe how I, how I treat the material uh, and the indiv interview. So the reader can actually judge himself if I've done it in a good way or in a, in a bad way, or what liberties I took. Uh, but it's... Um, uh, 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 this interlocking effect with uh, uh, describing Stieg and sometimes describing Olof Palme and sometimes describing what, what Stieg does and using the text of Stieg Larsson. That, that's the way I think you can actually digest such a huge material because it is and uh, it, it, it's a lot of uh, material. I think the book is close to 500 pages, four, pages 450 probably in French. With 400 in Swedish, um, so um, it, it's it's a lot of information, but it's I hope it's written as so you actually feel that there's an a dra dramatic arch in the book, and you get to a climax close to the end of the book. Um, so that's the idea. Yeah, that's okay. And did you want uh, to? Can we say that you wanted to carry? a national trauma into the international arena with this book? Yes, I, I think it, it's a national trauma for Sweden. I don't want the world to be traumatized. It's enough <laughs> with uh, COVID-19. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but 
I wanted to, the world to know about this interesting event because it's not only a, a, a Swedish event, this uh, the murder of our prime minister. Uh, I think that it's actually um, an international event where you have uh, um, the actions of foreign security services, uh, the South African security service and the, the CIA and possibly even the French one. So there's uh, actually, it's a political event that uh, was actually happened towards the end of the Cold War. Hmm. Speaking about uh, Cold War, uh, you've uh, you have conducted your own investigation. We have investigated the work, dates, places, name, your documentary research, interviews, even undercover. Um, it feels like uh, espionage. Did you did you feel like a spy? Can you tell us about these feelings about uh, this situation? Well, you told before that I, I found the archive of Stieg Larsson and then I managed to get the access to it and also to use it exclusively. And that it was a long series of coincidences. And, and, and I, I never expected to come in this situation, but when I found this material and I saw that Stieg Larsson was actually a pretty normal guy, but he did, he did pretty dairy things. He infiltrated the right-wing movements of Sweden and he was actually using hackers to get into emails and stuff and then uh, also meeting quite dangerous uh, characters um, in Sweden and outside Sweden. Then I decided that I have to do something similar if I want to, to get to the truth. Stieg didn't have time, he died when he was 50 and I, I started when I was around 50 years old to meet the people that he, he would have met. Uh, and So I had to step out of my comfort zone. So it was definitely I, maybe I didn't feel like a spy, I was more scared, but uh, and I got used to it and, and it was uh, actually one of the more entertaining periods of my life. <laughs> I guess so, I guess so. Um, your story is a story about uh, journalists and newspaper. You, we can quote Expo, Searchlight, TT News Agency, Pagans Nyuter, Arbitet. Do you want it to pay homage to these professions to recall its public utility in this time of conspiracies and fake news? It's a, that's an interesting question. I actually, I probably didn't think about it that, in that way, but it, but it, it, it can be a, serve as a reminder to the old way of journalism where actually journalists had time to do investigative projects because at least not in Sweden, they, they don't have the time the big titles, the big newspapers, they probably have more readers and more readership if you count the digital one, but they have much less time. They, uh, they need to write an article in an hour or two hours on, based on very basic material and to have someone work on a, on a story for one or two or three months, that's not possible. Um, so it's, it's a reminder that it can actually, or it should be possible for journalists to work in a much more thorough way. Uh, and that's described to some extent in the book, how, how Stieg worked and how they worked at Searchlight and Expo and, and some of the other titles. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Journalism for one part and uh, novels for, for the other part. I, um, you, you revealed to us the, the context in which the Millennium Saga was conceived. You multiply references to the novel, events, chapter titles, character postures, um, are you telling us that this successful saga is finally the pretext for a deeper reflection, thinking on the darkness of society? Um, well, that's, that, that's a tough one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Take your time. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I added the thing, these things to the story because um, I think that it's really interesting, the, li the thin line between reality and fiction. Yeah. Uh, if you read a non-fiction book, it's always from the angle of the author. Uh, and there is always a, a selection of facts that he puts in, he or she puts in there. So it's actually always uh, some sort of um, subjective view on it. Uh, so I would say that it's overlapping uh, by default. 
And it's only now that we realize that you can actually move over the border. You can say that a book is actually nonfiction, but you have dialogues in it, like in my book, or based on a true story, as you see all the time in Netflix and all the time, or based on true events. And there's 90% that is true, but it's still considered a, a fiction story. And, and this line, I think that that will continue to be blurred uh, and investigated, actually, and, <laughs> and, and used in, in new types of stories. And I think it's, it's, uh, the, it's definitely the place where I want to be also with my next book and my next book. Oh. I will probably always write this close to reality. That's what what I enjoy, and I enjoy reading also. And well, I have some question about books, um, and maybe you can tell us more about uh, your next one. Um, the story of, of Stieg Larsson is seems to be a, a book about books, also because you talked uh, obviously about Millennium, but uh, you talk about uh, the book that wrote um, Okan Hermansson and Lars Venander. Uh, mm -hmm. The joint book with uh, Anna and Stig on the far right, uh, the book of uh, Alfred Nerstrom uh, about the failure of Olaf Palme, Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad, well, the book about uh, apartheid and guns and money. And how much do books feel, feed you? Sorry, how much do they inspire you? I've, I've used a lot of books in this book. Um, uh, as as a background, um, uh, because there's so much written about the Palma story, and that connects to what you started with. I, I wanted to write uh, an accessible book, because uh, I have um, maybe maybe seventy books, maybe more. No, it must be more. I, I probably have a hundred, hundred and twenty books about the Palma murder, um, but I probably haven't read one of. Uh, any of them from start to finish, okay. because it's a lot of facts, it's a lot of witnesses, or it's a, it's a things that, so that it's really good to use as uh, dictionaries, mm -hmm. but they're impossible to, 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 to write. Uh, so what I, uh, to, to read. So I, what I've done is actually to take the information from, from a, lot, a lot of these books and try to put it into this context also, and use it together with Stieg's archives and my own thoughts. So they have been extremely important for this book. Um, and, uh, but I think as anybody else, I must confess that I'm reading much too little um, uh, because it's, uh, it, it's this fragmentizing with all the short messages, the short text, and that take up so much focus and time that uh, I, I read too little. But, but at the moment I'm in a, in a reading period. I'm doing a lot of research into, for my next book. So now I'm, I'm in the Swedish countryside, and I've lot of, got a lot of time, a lot of COVID time, uh, and I can actually read, read almost the full books, many books about my next subject. So that's what I'm doing. Oh. So that's inspiring. Yeah. Um, your chapters are short. The narration is factual. You create suspense if necessary. You talked about a thriller. Um, could we say that you draw inspiration from uh, detective fiction? So we can we can say that. Yes, definitely. Uh, from Stieg Larsson's own books, um, and he, reminding what you said about the referring to other books, he does that. Uh, in all his three novels, he actually refers to the Palmer murder, and he also refers to other books. He even reviews books. He puts the word of what he thinks about the books into the mouth of uh, Michael Blomqvist. So it's, it's actually, he, he, he's using that element in his books also. Um, yeah. Okay. And um, would you like to, to tell us some, some words about your novelist wishes, your, your, the, the books you, you wanted to write? I want to, um, I will continue for one or two books, the next one definitely, and maybe one more, about the, the same time, because the 1980s, just before the Cold War ended, uh, there are a lot of things that happened that actually made the war end, and I think it ended well. The, we, we didn't get uh, Soviet Union all over Europe. Um, the murder of our prime minister, 
uh, was one of them. Uh, and there were a lot of other events happening, people that were murdered, uh, innocent people, and less innocent people, but murdered people. Um, and I'm writing, we write about that for one or two books. And then I will write uh, something that will be only for fun. Uh, I want to write something that is entertaining and that you can laugh about. Yeah. <laughs> so something lighter, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I understand. Um, uh, by reading you, I was uh, struck by the geographic dimension of the story. You have crime scene, topography, investigative travel, and how do you associate this special dimension to your way of telling? Yeah, well, when I started uh, investigating, doing the research, it was actually a small story when it came to people, well, maybe one or two characters or um, um, three at the maximum. And it was a, a Swedish story. Uh, and then I found Stig's archive and I realized that he believed in an international conspiracy. And then it was South Africa and it was Cyprus, the middleman in Cyprus, and it was London and it was the US possibly. Um, so it, it came, came natural that it grew from a very individual small story to a, a much bigger conspiracy, also in, in, in the space where I, so I, I, I needed to travel and, and um, I think it becomes interesting that it's only not in one place. There are writers that can wrote, write an interesting novel just inside a, a room. Um, but this is probably not my case. I, 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 uh, also, the next book will be all over the world um, because it's an international story. And, and then you can use that as an element. And I, hopefully I've used it well. I, I think that, that the time when I meet the middleman in Cyprus or when I go to South Africa and meet the murderers, they are some of the more tense intense uh, chapters of the book, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I can that. And do you think, uh, do you agree with, you, with the, the idea that the place has an influence on the, on the attitude and the, on the scenes and on the, on the, on the, the people? So, uh, they, uh, they have an, uh, you mean uh, where I started the story uh, with the influence of the place? Yeah. Yeah. For instance, yeah, because yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, yeah, I'm, I'm very impressed by how much you know about the book. Actually, <laughs> I can see that you have read it in uh, in detail. Thank you. Um, but but the, the the start of it was actually only three kilometers from here. In 2008, when I wanted to write, write my, start writing a book, uh, my second book, then uh, and, um, and there was they found a lady killed here, just three kilometers from my house where I'm now. Um, and when I googled that place um, uh, where she was found, I, I realized that there was another murder, mm. but 170 years earlier in the same farm, um, which made me think that if there's one murder, one place where there have been double murders, that there must be more. And I found a few other places, and one of them actually led me to a person who was suspecting the murder of Olof Palme, which led me to the archive of Stieg Larsson. Um, so, so the places led me into this story, but I, I have a strong belief that where we are and where we grow up and where we spend time has a strong influence on us, stronger than we realize. And, and that's why it's important to, to spend time in places where you, you feel harmony and you can actually become creative and, and actually work it in a good way, so yeah. So I think they have a, an extremely strong influence on you. Okay. Speaking about people, um, you you give you gave us um, uh, many documents in your book: pictures, maps, letters, and they are more than than just evidence. Um, do they look like uh, clues to the reader to be involved to participate in this uh, investigative work? Yeah, I, I think it's my idea that the reader should gradually realize where the story is going, of course, but also be, be something of a, an armchair detective, reading the, diff, the background material and, and see what Steve was seeing at the moment and what I saw when I read, read, read his documents also. 
Uh, and then you see, for instance, that in, in a letter only 20 days after the murder happened, I think it's seven pages long, and Stieg writes about the possibility that there were South African weapon dealings behind the murder of our prime minister. And that's only less than three weeks after the murder. And that's something that hasn't really been investigated by the police. And hopefully that's uh, actually what is happening very soon because the police has said that they will present the solution uh, within two months' time. Um, and I think that they have done so. And hopefully it's because of Stig's work and maybe to some extent my work also. Okay, thanks. Um, we have a few minutes left. Um, I'd like you to come back to a key moment for you in this investigation, a, a moment, a passage that is dear to your heart or that you are proud of. Or can you tell us about, about it? Uh, I, I should choose one. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, because I, I, I stepped out of my comfort zone, as I said, uh, when I started meeting these people that are, are dangerous or at least have been very dangerous. Uh, but I think that the brave person in this is actually the, the Czech woman that I met, uh, mm -hmm. Lida Komarka. Yeah. And I think that the most intense time and event was actually when uh, I asked her to meet uh, the person that I still think is heavily involved in the killing of our prime minister. Um, and she records, she meets with him for six days and records everything and actually gather things that can be used in a, in a possible prosecution. Um, and she was the brave person because she met him, with him in his apartment and spent a lot of time with him and, and filming and recording everything. And I think that that's, that's the thing that I'm, I'm proud of and also think is the most uh, intense in the book. I think it's working because I, I felt the same. <laughs> I felt, uh, I felt uh, afraid for her and uh, I think it's working, yes. Okay, <laughs> so, that's good. <laughs> well done. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have two more questions and uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll have uh, to end the uh, the, this interview. Um, there was a screen adaptation in uh, 2018 of, by uh, Enric uh, Gorson. Uh, what mm -hmm. do you think about it? Um, yeah, I, I, I was the executive producer and it, it, it was, all, was also built to some extent on my material. Um, and it, was, it tells uh, a, a good story about Stig Larsson as, as a person. Um, uh, I, so I think it's it's a, it's a, it's a pretty okay documentary, but I think it should have been um, focusing more on on the more exciting parts of his work because Stieg Larsson is not actually. Um, I, I think they should have put more emphasis on the the Palma murder uh, actually. So that's that's um, uh, that's actually where it started the project project and in the end, but. It, it sometimes you have to leave your babies for someone else to 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 deal to and Henrik this is what he did with it and and, and I think it's a it's a fair job yeah to leave the baby isn't that too difficult <laughs> sorry uh, to leave the baby isn't that isn't uh, that too difficult to do yeah yeah it is uh, but I realize also that my um I'm, I'm for me it's much better to write books because I can I can control the whole chain uh, of material and what I what I want to tell, and it's it's so it's so. I think it's actually a great uh, profession in that sense because you you're it's only up to you. If it's if you write a bad book, then uh, it's your fault. If you write a good book, it's only your uh, because of you. Um, and and this time I managed to to write a book that has been sold in more than three hundred thousand copies and it, in twenty seven languages. So. Uh, um, um, it's been an, an, an incredible journey for me actually to, to, to do this. So I will be writing books and uh, the films I hope uh, other, other people will make. Yeah. Uh, thanks, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, you have, you have um, a website, stoklasa.com, uh, mm -hmm. in which the investigation seems to continue. And uh, your site talks about the, the walkie-talkie there that was found. Uh, uh, could you tell us um, uh, a bit more about this? Yeah, it was uh, something that I, I found during my research for the book. 
uh, and I wanted to include, but I didn't get to the bottom of it. But after the book was published, I decided that I will try once again. And then I found uh, what I've, the, the persons that I've heard about uh, several years ago. Boys uh, at the time, that one or two days after the murder of our prime minister, actually um, along the escape route of the murder, um, they were out walking and they found a walkie talkie hidden in the snow. Um, and uh, they picked it up and they were young guys. So they were saying, maybe it's got to do with the murder of our prime minister, but maybe not. The police probably would have found it. So they, instead, they, instead of give, handing it into the police, they, handed, they gave it to a young boy. Um, uh, but it's if the, the place where it was found and the time connects extremely well to several witnesses. So I think it's a, a very important supporting evidence uh, in actually finding uh, the people that were involved in, in, the, in the killing. And it's uh, the first time you can prove that there was most likely more than one person involved in the killing. Uh, because uh, as you know, you need two walkie talkies to, to be able to communicate. So. Um, so I, I think it was uh, uh, very important supporting evidence. Yeah, and we thank you. Yes, that was my last uh, question. Did you want to add something um, to reveal us something else uh, you wanted to want uh, once you want uh, us to know? Uh, maybe I'm, I'm writing the, the next book will be about uh, not about the same murder, but it will be about another murder where actually a couple of hundred people were murdered uh, because of events that were connected to the same uh, dirt dealings that were going on in this book. So there will be a continuation. There will be a sequel to, to La Folle Enquête uh, Stig Larsson, uh, and it will be, uh, will be ready in let's say less than a year, uh, published in yeah. just over a year. Okay, okay. we look forward. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan. I was uh, very pleased to, to discuss with you. And uh, thanks to Village Lay to have received us uh, here <laughs> in this virtual way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Nikolai. It's it's always good to speak to someone who has actually prepared the question so well and also know the uh, the whole book in, in detail because then yeah. you can go go beyond the actual uh, yeah. most obvious things. So uh, that was very good. Very good. Thank you. That was my pleasure. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Nicola. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.